Hello? Does this thing work? This is the Peak Boredom Podcast. Three, two, one. <laughs> hey everyone, welcome back to the Peak Boredom Podcast. Woo! So guest with us, we have Tuna. Hello Tuna. <laughs> so Tuna was one of the friends that I met when we went to language school in Taiwan. We both went to the language school in the National Taiwan University. So welcome Tuna. <laughs> Welcome to hey, it's, uh, it's a pleasure to take part. Tuna was one of those people that I thought was normal, and then the more he spoke about himself, the less normal it sounded. <laughs> no offense. Uh, I'll take it as a compliment. Great. So, prefix. He works for the U- UN. He works for the United Nations, guys. And what exactly do you do in the United Nations again? And what exactly is it? Technically speaking, I'm a consultant for the UN. Or one of the UN's uh, different organizations. The organization that I work for is the International Narcotic uh, Control Board, which uh, focuses on uh, narcotic offenses. And the uh, branch and project I work on is aimed at uh, supply reduction. But I'm here, of course, today as the private person Tuna and not <laughs> as an official uh, spokesperson for the organization. Yeah. None of these represent the UN. <laughs> no, yeah. not a prefix. So this is a conversation with a person, and that uh, our views are our own. Now I just sound like a newscast. <laughs> so disclaimer. Disclaimer, oh, yeah, yeah. guys. Yeah. So you've been working for the UN as a consultant. I'm guessing um, before we actually met in Taiwan. How did you get in? Like, what was the application process like? Uh, so technically, what you're saying is not really t- true. I was working, but I was working as an intern. I started when I came back from Malaysia in 2018, June. I started working as an intern. Then I took a gap in between, went to Taipei, returned back, and then I started in September 2019 to work as a consultant. The application process. So I always. Had a particular interest for drugs and crime. I mean, uh, not doing it, but just as a as a topic thing. You know, generally, I think it's just a very dynamic, very interesting topic. So the UN agency that I always wanted to work for actually was my dream job, and it is still to this day. Work for under the umbrella of UNODC. UNODC, the United Nations Office on Drugs and Crime, very administratively also part of it. And I applied many, many times just to have, let's say, bad uh, unpaid internship. <laughs> I, I saw, I saw those. Yeah, like uh, most internships in the UN, except for a few organizations, are unpaid, which, in my personal opinion, is a bit of an unfair thing because it kind of eliminates a lot of people who don't have the opportunities and the means to. Sustain themselves, you know, half a year in an expensive city like Vienna or Geneva or wherever. So I'm personally, I can openly say I think not a fan of this system. But uh, luckily, I could afford uh, being an unpaid intern for a while, and I applied for this unpaid internship on the different parts of uh, UNODC. I think more than 30 times. Yeah. So for for me, it was always a numbers game. Like, at the end of the day, it's gonna happen, you know. I'm just gonna try to improve every single uh, application that I send. On the way, my experiences got a little bit better here and there. And the most important factor was I have a very clu- cro- um, close group of friends from from high school. I know them since oh, 20 years now. <laughs> and, wow. Okay. Uh, they always go through my applications. They always we open usually a Google Docs file. I write in my first raw draft, they write in comments, they just criticize me all over, uh, tell me all the bad things that I have written, and all the things that I could have improved. And this is honestly good. You know, I'm, I'm a strong believer in criticism. It comes with good intent. This is the most useful thing that somebody can give you, except food. Uh, <laughs> uh, I was accepted a long time before I started, actually, at somewhere completely different. I was actually scheduled to start a posting in Southeast Asia because I applied to every single regional office as well and Southeast Asia is the region I'm interested in 
and also topic wise I specialized in that region a little bit during my studies so I applied to you know Jakarta, Phnom Penh, uh, Bangkok, Manila wherever there is a regional office I sent in an application oftentimes the emails returned because the people were not working there anymore but I just pushed 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 and I got the okay and it was winter 2017 and but sometimes things take a long long time so I ended up before I got the final off, uh, you know, you got like an email that you got approved. It took such a long time that I actually ended up working in Vienna, where I actually lived where I grew it. So I guess it worked out pretty fine, but maybe on a slightly different circumstances. Oh wait, where was your UN unpaid internship? Was it in Malaysia? No. No, no. In, in Malaysia, I also did an internship, but it was for the Austrian embassy, and that was paid. Oh. Uh, there's a lot of regional offices of UNODC and I applied to all of them. I don't want to disclose which one accepted me because oh, cool. it took a long while for them to reply. But sometimes things can be a pain. Sometimes things can be very difficult in, in, in difficult duty stations where you have a uh, limited amount of manpower. So I definitely understand uh, sometimes things can take a little bit longer than usual. But yeah. It was before my time in Malaysia. I applied, and my plan was to after Malaysia, go to somewhere close by. Didn't work out. Ended up in Vienna, stayed, and I'm not particularly unhappy about that. I was actually eyeing on a UN internship for my planning master. But yeah, you're right. I couldn't afford it. I mean, one of the one I was looking for is New York, and I was like, ah. Uh... Like, this is great, and I probably have a chance with this, like, 1%, but yeah, the whole, like, unpaid internship is wrong for me, myself, because my family is not privileged enough to do that for me, but I think I've been sent that application so much right now, and I'm just like, ah, hmm, <laughs> maybe someday. <laughs> well, you know, there's some UN organizations that do pay, and don't quote me on that, look that up yourself. But I think maybe the World Health Organization, World Food Program, I think, not sure. But definitely, you know, from the agencies in Vienna, the International uh, Atomic Agency, they have paid internships, which last a year, which is, I think, a very good opportunity to learn. Not everybody that works there is a nuclear engineer. They have all kinds of people. They're actually the biggest organization within the UN. Vienna a compound. So we have another small organization called CPBTO that you can also look up. They also offer paid internships. So, you know, there are some possibilities. You just have to scout and then uh, apply, apply, apply. That's the, the thing that I would definitely recommend. You know, a single application, yeah. of course, very likely to be definitely. not successful. So don't put your hopes in, in just one thing, you know. Keep, if it's your dream, if you really want it, then you should definitely uh, read application and what is desired and tailor your application to that and just keep applying. You know, I, I always think people have a wrong mindset when it gets close to applications. I know our generation, we're all kind of in a not such a good situation because no. uh, being a university is not a guarantee to find a good job anymore, right? So you, yeah. everybody that I know of has a very frustrating experience in job market. So instead of taking each application as a process where, oh, I failed again, I failed again. It's just like a learning opportunity, right? I mean, every application is good for you. You're going to learn something in every application that you send. Even if, it, if they don't even invite you for an interview, you will have written your CV, you will have tweaked your CV, you will have updated it, you will have put in some things, you will think about it. So, you know, this is all just, uh, if you see all this as part of the game and there's little steps, then it's less frustrating. And I think, you know, the, the whole process can be beneficial itself. And, you know, job application is a skill by itself. I think that some people who are like, really good qualified are not so good at marketing themselves. And I think that's some, definitely something that a lot of people could improve on including myself. I always assumed that the UN was like a diplomatic body. So how different was it working for them versus the embassy? Because I always assumed that the UN stuff would be more diplomatic work. But like when you explained it to me previously, it didn't sound very as much diplomatic as I thought it would be. So 
the UN is a very big organization, right? It has offices all around, and you know, just I don't even know, but just the compound that you had at in Vienna, which the building we call Vienna International Center, has around 5,000 people working. So you have all kind of people, all kind of position, and my job is certainly not so. Uh, diplomatic, it's very practical oriented. There are diplomats also working for the UN. The permanent missions, you have people that represent their country for these specific UN organizations and their liaison officers sent from all around the world within this uh, framework to to liaison with, with other countries, folks and other people who work in international organizations. But, you know, not everybody is, is a diplomat actually. A lot of people are the very basic, you know, like secretary jobs. I don't want, I don't want to say very basic, but uh, administrative work, you know, which can be very demanding, actually. Uh, but you always need to have a, a large group of administrative people in any bureaucratic, international or national level. It also, is the same for the for the embassy. If you think of uh, working in the embassy, sometimes in, in smaller embassies, you will have one diplomat ambassador and then you'll have a lot of other people working consular work administrative work interns uh, local people national people working drivers etc so not everybody i think um one of the positions that you were you also advertise un positions on your personal profile which is interesting but one of them was a drug officer what exactly is that because when we think officer, I think we think of police enforcement and stuff like that. Yeah, well, there is no such thing as drug officer, but there is such a thing as a drug control officer, for the best oh, of yeah. my knowledge. And uh, drug control officer would be people that, it, it's it, in the UNODC uh, framework, uh, you'll have some postings like this, and probably the specific uh, application can be different, they can have different roles. All drug control officers, they help uh, law enforcement officers, custom officers all around the world in the team of supply reduction. And supply reduction is basically the word for helping them find these narcotics drugs or as we call it, dangerous substances because it's a wide variety of uh, substances. Some of them are under international control. Some of them are actually not under international control and therefore they have uh, different kind of frameworks in different countries which can make things difficult and that's where our drug control officers uh, come in and it's usually a UN staff position or like mine because I am a consultant who basically consults helps the specific project. I think everything depends on the, the position and the places you apply to just because of the different styles of communities and stuff. So I guess into a more light-hearted topic, as someone who grew up in Europe and you've managed to travel to... How many countries have you traveled in Asia? I don't know. I haven't counted a few countries. I mean, I've dropped by a few countries. I lived in a few others. Which one was your favorite and why? I had this question uh, because it's, uh, it really depends on, 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 on my mood and whatever I feel like. I mean, I miss every place I lived at in a, in a different way, right? Um, so I lived in Manila and I really miss Manila because before I came there, I heard a lot of bad things about it. Everybody was telling me about traffic, flying cockroaches, earthquakes, uh, and uh, congestion. And while this is all true, there's a whole different side to the, the city. I guess this is also similar to what people say about Jakarta and the common uh, opinion about the, these cities. But I mean, it's such a huge city where there's a lot of people, subcultures, really nice nightlife, and uh, most and foremost, super friendly who go out of their way to help you. And one of my favorite stories that I like to tell, it's actually a very boring story, but <laughs> when I first started uh, working there, I always, not always, but sometimes I used the jeepney, which is a very long extended jeep. Double check, fact check this story, but according to the best of my knowledge, when the United States left the Philippines, they had a bunch of these military jeeps and they sold them all for, I think, one dollar. And then the locals, they changed these jeeps to make them like super large, so they serve as a public transportation vehicle. 
and uh, sometimes I just couldn't get a taxi home, so I was forced to take the GP, and it's a bit uncomfortable because I'm not the tallest person in the world, but I it was still I felt you know claustrophobic. I didn't feel claustrophobic, but it's just like very unpleasant if you're in a suit and you're just <laughs> inside a tuna can. By the way, <laughs> I like that pun. Uh, but I I had to. A commute to a place of the city where it was a little bit more, you know, rough working class, no foreigners, and then I had to change from there to go to the central business district. And once I my my wallet that out, and I had a, a, a big chunk of, of money, at least for for me within the, uh, within my uh, sorry sorry, you know, you forgot your wallet. And while this is just like a super random and boring story, I still wanted to share because a lot of the time you hear the story about, oh, I went to this place and I got mud, right? But this happens so rarely compared to the other experience that I think these stories are actually worth telling. And Philippines is a really great place filled with a lot of friendliest people on the planet. I really had a good time there, despite what everyone was saying before. Uh, when it comes to the other cities that, that I cannot speak for, like the, the whole country, but Malaysia, Kuala Lumpur is certainly very livable. It has excellent, uh, I mean, there's not a lot of transportation, public transportation options, but the public transportation they have is actually rather efficient and good, I would say comparatively, of course. But uh, I really like their food culture. They have these stalls they call uh, Nasi Kandar or Mamak, which was were founded according to my friends. Also, please fact check this by Muslim Indians. And they have a huge variety of food. It's like a ridiculous amount of different food options and they're open a lot of them are open 24 hours and it's a very democratic place it's a place where you'll have somebody coming with a Ferrari and you have two working class people sharing a bread together on the next table and I usually like these places this was like one of the places where I really felt comfortable because Malaysia is really comforting when it comes to you know being laid back and accepting towards different accepting about different people you know coming from from abroad and uh, different cultures i think malaysia is a lot more international actually than what westerners believe i mean like same so with many, jakarta yeah i mean they don't we we did never learned in school about you know southern chinese migrants and their subcultures sub communities within southeast asia that's like something that you know i slowly picked up slowly found bits and pieces, talking with my, my friends, finding out, oh, they actually don't speak Mandarin, they speak, I don't know, they speak Hakka, they speak Hokkien, they speak <laughs> Cantonese. Me? They, so they, different. Their food is actually even different from the mainland. I mean, oh, some yeah, of yeah. my favorite foods in Malaysia are, and I, I was told, it's, it's very Chinese in the terms of how it looks like, but you know, some things have changed, of course, over time. And now my friend, my, my dear friend in, in Malaysia, he told me that the famous, one of my favorite noodle dishes is the Hokkien Mee. Oh, and I was Hokkien. told that, we have yeah, a tuna. It was, it was, I was told that actually, if you go to a place, you know, a province around that area, where they, they I think it's Fujian province, uh, where they, the migrants came from, uh, you couldn't find that because that food has just developed over time uh, in these communities. So I, I think the Chinese Malay food is particularly interesting and, and one of my favorites. But I have to admit that it's a little bit better in Penang than in KL. So, oh yeah, no, uh, Penang Kuei Tiao is the best. <laughs> yeah, the Cha Kuei Tiao is definitely I love Cha Kuei Tiao. <laughs> I, I, I'm really like, I, I'm a big fan of, uh, you know, Pad Thai and every Westerner knows Pad Thai but nobody knows Chai Thai still and I think it's a, it's a really sad story that people don't know about such great food and such great cuisines actually. So don't sad. have any Malay food. I don't know a single Indonesian restaurant in, in, in Vienna either. I mean, there, there are some Chinese 
slash fusion places where the chef would be Indonesian. And I don't know any other like Indonesian place. So whenever I go to like a very multicultural city like like London, for example, I specifically look for Malay food and I have my roti chennai and then I'm like really happy. Yeah, because people don't seem to understand. Okay, so I'm half Hokkien, half Hakka. I think that's what my parents told me. And I think they mentioned that the Hokkien's come from the Fujian area, but the food is definitely very different. We do have chakwe tiao. Uh, Indonesians have chakwe tiao, they love it. So much so that when my friend and I, so my flatmate when I was in Manchester was also Indonesian. We had some Malaysian friends over and fundamentally our languages are similar but different. So Malaysian people say that Indonesian sounds old compared to Malay. And then Malay is more of a language of like abbreviations and shortcut words and stuff like that. But weirdly enough, the words that they understood were nasi goreng and chakwe tiao. Those were the two only like statements they understood out of our entire Yeah, so <laughs> I'm just Sumatran Indonesian from both my mom and dad which people don't even know, but yay! So it means that the food that I'm from is more... So the places where my parents, where my parents' parents grew up are more heavily influenced by the Chinese, especially the Hakkas. So a lot of our food, also our religions are different than from like the main Indonesians, I guess, because a lot of people in Sumatra, Medan especially, are Christian so a lot of our food have pork in it and it's like so it, food is like very different around Indonesia I know the food I eat is not necessarily the same that people eat in Java which we which we in Inga grew up in yeah definitely I don't even think we're taught in our own history books about how like the southern Chinese migrants moved to Southeast Asian countries I had to learn from my mom because I don't think my dad tells me much about it, but my mom is like super invested in history. <laughs> so she tells me like everything. But yeah, it's interesting. Actually, when we were in Taipei, you told me that it was your mission to try a different restaurant every single day, which is quite the accomplishment. Did you do the same thing in other countries? No, not really. I mean, I, I, my time in Taipei was really nice. I really love the street food culture and the food culture in Taipei. I think it's also massively underrated. I think it's one of the best cities in the world for food because it has such a oh, my friend says strong too. Chinese food culture influence from very different parts of China, right? They have like northern restaurants, they have southern restaurants. I went to a Hakka restaurant once, which was totally different again. But at the same time, they have Japanese influence to an extent where a lot of the things need to be just perfect every single time. And also very good Japanese food options. I mean, I have not seen, I have not eaten as good Japanese food outside of Japan, uh, any other place than, than Taipei. So, and a lot of like, if you're, if you know how the city is structured, you have a lot of these old buildings probably built around the 70s, I guess. And their ground floors are usually open during daytime and the old grandmother or grandfather is just rolling it up and, and cooking some cooking some stuff, some, some spring onion pancakes, or things like that. And that's usually really, really good. And the density of the places where you can have food is just so... That's one of the things I really miss because in Austria, to me. So I thought, you know, why not make the best out of it and just try to learn as much as you can. So about the food culture, which I'm eating a lot and I'm, I'm not good in many things, but I'm pretty good at eating a lot. So that's uh, what I what I planned and, and did and I was really happy. I wish I would have done the same in other countries, other places, but I just didn't have that uh, flexibility that I had because I just had one thing to do in Taipei yeah. instead of trying to I... maneuver, juggle 20 different yeah, I think my sister told me that her teacher gained 10 kilos when they were in Taiwan. So when she told them, oh, my sister is studying Mandarin in Taiwan, he said, oh, I gained 10 kilos there, just eating. Did you grow up in the Austrian school system then? Or was it, where did you go to school? So I was originally born in, in, in Turkey, in Istanbul. But I, my, my family, my mother came here when I was like, my second birthday I had already celebrated in Vienna. 
it was a crazy party. <laughs> oh, okay. Uh, I was just kidding. But, but I'm in Vienna since a long time. I went to kindergarten in Vienna. I went uh, you know, every single step of school and so the university, I finished university at the University of Vienna. I think a few minutes ago you mentioned that one of the good things you're at doing is eating. You're, one of the good things that you like to do is eating. How exactly did you get a job as a McDonald's taste tester? I didn't even know that was a thing. Yeah, yeah, all around. Yeah, but we have to stay confidential, so I'm not sure how much I can tell you. No, I don't do it anymore. But when I uh, used to be a te- uh, when I used to be a student in the university, I actually had a friend who, who was doing this kind of testing of things, and not just McDonald's products, all kinds. You know, some if you have a driving license, which I still don't plan on getting you can test uh, you can go to a car shop and, and have a talk with them drive around the car or something or uh, go to pharmacies and ask them for advice or you can go buy theater ticket it's it's a broad range i only did the mcdonald's test and it was really good because you you get the money back that you invested and you always have to buy a main menu at the time instead of cap to like eight euro maximum so if it's 850 the 50 cents and you'd get the additional fee of like ten dollar per test, ten euro per test, which was really good, you know, because it combined, it, you could collect a little bit of money here and there, and you could fulfill the dream job of every child, right? Trying to oh, eat yeah. free at McDonald's, but you know, after a certain while, it just blew. I just lost interest because you have to actually eat at McDonald's when you don't want to eat at McDonald's, which happens because you have to do it every single week. And I haven't been in McDonald's in a few weeks now, and I don't really like it. It's just like the options in Vienna, food options are not so great, things are not open so late. They don't have street food, kind of illegal to, to have uh, any carts on the street that, that serve food. You don't really see that here. So sometimes you're just hungry, it's close by and you go to McDonald's. But yeah, it was a, it was a fun experience and I learned a lot of things from it. Contrary to what, what people might assume, one of the things that I learned was that people working at McDonald's are very sensitive towards so Mr. Uh, Parts? the reports that, because after you do the test, you have to write you know, how many minutes did it take for them to prepare the, the menu, did they ask oh. if you have a bonus club card, uh, how was the food, how was the side dish, how was the drink, how clean was the, what was it, uh, etc, etc. They're very sensitive towards the criticism and that's all I want to say about that. Which is fair. <laughs> because I think I told you about the McDonald's Prosperity Burger, which was only available in Asia. I tried it. Yeah, that was definitely something that I liked during my high school years because it would rain a lot in our high school. Wait, so... is, is this the chicken one that's like... No, 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 it's the black pepper one. Oh yeah, that was good. <laughs> And I think like I told you about it, and then a few days later, I think you wrote a report on your Facebook about it, <laughs> or like you analyzed the flavors. What goes on in your mind when you like taste a brand new item from a menu to write that, that kind of report? Other than oh yeah, it's good, or like oh it's not that good. Especially I think in Asia, Asia I think the McDonald's are really different. McDonald's is different in every single country. Yeah, in my opinion, one of the most adaptive companies in the world. Uh, during my studies of social anthropology, I'm a social anthropologist. During my studies in social anthropology, we had this really interesting class which was about anthropology of food. And uh, we saw a documentary about McDonald's entering a small village in France that was very proud about their food culture. And the people, to the best of my knowledge, they tore down the place completely. They like bought every single uh, like uh, nail and everything, they destroyed the McDonald's. Uh, <laughs> but McDonald's still went through. There was like a large, also national uprising, a lot of nationalism combined. French people being proud of their food and like anti kind of feeling. But then McDonald's evolved in a way that nowadays, at the time of the documentary, I'm not sure if this is still true, but regardless, it's very impressive. France was the second biggest market for McDonald's. So then they, they had like salad bars, they were serving wine in McDonald's, so they adapted to the, to the national needs. And now it's, it's fairly popular. And if you go to countries like the Philippines, for example, you will see that McDonald's, once again, is a totally different place where a lot of people are actually fried chicken there. And it's very similar to the concept of the national big. One of the things that Filipinos are most proud of is their most favorite uh, fast food place, which is 
Jollibee. Jollibee. Yeah. Jollibee. And McDonald's in the Philippines is, I hope nobody kills me for saying this, but a bit similar because they also have the familiar items, and gravy and a lot of fried chicken and stuff. So it's like totally different than in Vienna. In Vienna, they also, in Austria, they readapted to the local meat. They got a lot more expensive. And now they're fighting <laughs> that their burgers have beef from Austria. And now there's vegetarian options. So they always keep improving. In Turkey, they have a McTurko, which is like in a pita-esque bread, you know. And it's the most favorite burger from Turkey. So really? they, are, they, they know the market. They analyze the market. They go in, they adapt. They're a smart company. That's why they're the most successful, one of the most successful franchises. We had like congee and like green tea ice cream. Oh, we had the durian McFlurry. Never tried it, never will. Uh, no. <laughs> I think when I was interning in Singapore, they had the nasi lemak burger. For oh, yeah, I've tried it. I've tried, I've tried it in Malaysia. It. I don't personally like it. It might be because like, the flavors from Malaysia might be different from Indonesia, so it doesn't fit. Or, or do you actually? Or not do you it? like it? I didn't like the. I like nasi lemak, <laughs> but I didn't like the nasi lemak burger. Interesting. But maybe they had a bad day. I don't know. <laughs> That's true. Maybe you know. It's definitely adaptive. I think they had in weirdly enough Taiwan's McDonald's does not have bubble tea, but the one in China does. But the stuff that they do have in Taiwan was black sesame McFlurries that I remember. They had the Taiwanese fried chicken with all that MSG. Ah, uh, that's yeah, the you best. You add the spicy thing and you and you mix it and then you eat it, which was the real fun eating experience. We have that too, yeah. Similar. It was, but I feel like I coughed a lot because like all the MSG just floated into the air. Yeah, the dust of MSG. Yeah, the, <laughs> I think the term in, in geography is glo localization. So you localize something that's globally. That's, that's just, just my nerd self talking. <laughs> now, another thing you once mentioned to me in Taiwan, interestingly, is that you love Anthony Bourdain more than you love your own dad. <laughs> But you said it had nothing to do with your dad. Why do you love Anthony Bourdain so much? That's so random. Uh, for me, he was always uh, a hero. What he did was much more than just a food show, you know. Traveling around eating is something that everybody could do. I could see bits and pieces of him where I thought Anthony Bourdain, without maybe actually knowing it, was such a good anthropologist, you know, just entering the place, the sphere, being so respectful to the locals and going native, uh, doing everything that the people did. You know, if sometimes if you need to get a tattoo, you would just say, "Okay, right." You would just go beyond what he is comfortable with to try to be as much respecting and adapted to the environment where he is at. And I definitely respect that. And he really has a good writing style. I mean, if you like his. TV shows and everything. I think his books are, are even better. And he was just an uh, inspiration and uh, a person that I think the world needs because it sh he showed us that the things we are afraid, you know, the cultures that are so far away, the people that are so different, they're actually, you know, not so bad and they're more similar in ways than, than, than we think. And he teach Americans because his primary audiences are Americans, right, to me not afraid of, of outside different cultures and I think that itself is a very valuable lesson so therefore he's he left a gap that nobody will in my opinion be, be able to fill because he also had the charisma that went along with it he is a graduate of a CIA which is the Culinary Institute of oh, America be like so that. he knows yes <laughs> as well so he has all the deep knowledge about kitchen life in, in America and he will tell the stories of the people that you would never hear, right? And the backbone of the American cuisine is held up by people from Honduras, Nicaragua, Mexico. They're not the, they're not the chefs. You don't see them. They are the ones that cook your food, right? So he shows the, the respect to them. These people tell the stories of them. And yeah, it's just, uh, you know, if I could desire to, to be like, uh, like one person in the world, it would be hands down without having to think for it. It would be 
I think what people don't understand with food is the way food is constructed has so much culture that we don't talk about because we just see it as food and um, food never is just food yeah right food is always in my opinion the biggest gate opener that can be in a society right you can never understand the society without eating the food in the way that people eat the food right and there's a lot of good books on this topic but you know how people eat affects their way of thinking and one of the favorite things that i like to say sure you probably heard that one before is that the food of a con- uh, country can be three different things this goes back to a historian called B.W. Higgs, I have his book here somewhere, and it was a book about like Jamaican food and identity. I just can't find it right now, so bear with me. Like, let's say Austrian food. What is Austrian food, right? It's, people like to throw that word around, but it's actually more complex than that. It can be three different things. It can be food made with products from Austria, regional products. Austria is uh, very proud of their product, and they're usually very high quality, right? Things made in Austria. This can be Austrian food. Other things could be food that is associated with Austria, so food that represents national identity, which would be the Vienna schnitzel, right? Famous Viennese schnitzel, you know, Love known it. all around the world, right? The thing is, actually, Viennese schnitzel is very expensive. It costs like mm. 20 euros nowadays. Yeah, yeah. It's made out of calf meat, mm-hmm. not, not pork, not chicken, right? Everybody outside that goes to a fake Austrian restaurant uh, abroad and get the option itself. No, English food is made out of coffee. And therefore, actually not even Viennese people eat it that often. So expensive, right? And the third thing is food that actually eaten by the people. And one dish can be all of these three things or it can not be, right? If you think about what Austrians eat most often, I would probably, you know, bet and say it's probably like a kebab dinner sandwich which is very popular here like a chicken sandwich uh, around the corner that a lot of Turkish people are, are doing here it's like super common Austrian eat, eat it because it's fast it's cheap. in my opinion the average kebab sandwich in Vienna is particularly good but that's the thing that people eat and uh, the historian Higgs was making a point that in the culture of Jamaica which is a fairly new country, they have established national food and they have packed it to the identity of the country, which is the salt fish in Ake. The Ake is a plant that uh, a lot of the, uh, the, that there is a story which might be a little bit mythical that uh, the slaves that came from the west coast of Africa, they brought it with them. So it's like one of the few things that is from, from Africa. And the salt fish is what the colonial people brought because saltfish by itself i could just talk for an hour about it but i think it's maybe one of the food items like rice or bread that influenced the history of, of, of mankind more than any other thing because i think it originally goes back to like scandinavian writings and then the spaniards and portuguese discovered it and it's basically a way of preserving protein fish for a very long period of time and as you know you know just being on a boat for Mumps is a very demanding task physically, so that allowed the seafarers to have a better source of protein to have to, to bring with them and to go around and conquer the whole world. So, history, you know, food always goes along. Uh, then they take bits and pieces, they brand things over the time, the mentality changes. Like, for example, a super famous popular thing in Vienna is now the Berlin burner sandwich because the way how they do like a Turkish shawarma sandwich in Berlin is a bit different so they would do it uh, a little bit differently and now Berlin style burner has become very popular in, in Vienna so you can see that food culture and uh, everything around it always uh, evolved very cultural very political yeah, it is political, isn't it? I think there's a whole category on it called gastropolitics, is it? And it seems very interesting because, oh no, I think it's, was it gastro diplomacy? It's how food can be political and how the relation between countries can be affected by the type of food you serve. 
the diplomats me and i think food is interesting actually recently i think they mentioned one of the previous editors of the bon appetit magazine he mentioned that one of the most underrated categories of food is actually african cuisine because i think people always associate high class food with french and they don't realize that asian food has become less marginalized than it has in the past and so now like one of the areas that we are really lacking in in terms of food discovery is probably anything out of the continent of africa except maybe egypt i don't know i don't actually know a lot about vietnam viennese food either or actually any austrian food except austrian viennese coffee that's, i i only know wiener schnitzel so <laughs> from the east and influencing the way how we think and the way how we eat so we have a little bit more of that goulash for example which is again to the best of my knowledge um, a Hungarian dish maybe it's Hungarian I have excellent goulash in the Hungarian community in Romania with the best I ever had this is also a like, very typical Austrian food which uh, has a Hungarian name but you know it just changes and there's the kraina sausage which is a really famous pork sausage which sometimes has cheese in it right now i think austria and slovenia or slovakia there is a dispute because they're trying to you know get the rights on that food as their national item and it's a big fight so it's indeed uh, as you say michelle very good we have the same fight i'm sorry malaysia with rendang <laughs> like the only time we were we us and um, well i'm not going to say like we have the dispute but the only time we agreed that rendang is like ours was when i think there was a cook that says that rendang is supposed to be crispy and all the malaysians oh yeah yeah i know that all the malaysian indonesians like are rendang you ate. crazy have you ever eaten a rendang that was so funny i think we ended up turning on singapore as well because i think What happened was Indonesians and Malaysians we like to fight about like which part of cultures are ours mm-hmm. and which ones are theirs because it's very similar, similar different like batiks and stuff like that as well. So culturally we're similar but we always fight about who belongs to what. But the moment one of the master chef judges I think. Yeah, I think it's He said that rendang should be crispy. That's it. The Malaysians and Indonesians were like that. That's out of the line. But <laughs> I think when Singaporeans started to pitch in and they're yeah, like you yeah. stay out of this. There, there's even like there was like ads that like targeted to like yes we know rendang is not crispy from like IKEA. So for like Asian IKEA which is so funny but that just goes to show like so Indonesian food because there's so much Chinese influence I think the Chinese food came in because they wanted to eat Chinese food too. but they don't have the spices so my dad always tells me the story it's called the peranakan food so the story was that the Ch- when when chinese people came to indonesia they wanted to create the same dishes that they had but they didn't have the spices so they would combine it with the spices they have and return that it tastes similar but it doesn't taste the same from like their original country i think that's where we develop our own cuisines medan foods or like batak foods definitely very chinese with all the pork but we also have plain batak they don't have pork but the taste is super similar to chinese food so i always thought that was super interesting the way food taste might be like different but they're like the same type of food and that Malaysian Indonesians can only agree when we are pitting oh, no. each other so gets food. <laughs> and then now Gordon Ramsay is coming in as well. I think he went to Sumatra to try to learn about rendang. <laughs> yeah, which is funny because he's like, yeah, we're uh, we're making the rendang in Indonesia, and then all the comments are like, yes, Indonesia guys. <laughs> <laughs> But it, Malaysian rendang is different. You know, there's a lot of different people who are traveling around the world and eating, and I think all of them contribute in some way or another. And I watch a lot of them actually. But you know, this Bourdain was very, very particular because 
Jesus. He went that extra mile trying to come in a way that other people are not doing or not able to do because they lack the emotional intelligence. I mean, there's a lot of YouTubers that I really like that go to really, really nice, interesting destinations. And I, I, I watch them, but they're, they're just not, I don't know, they're just not very good for people. And they cannot go on the surface. They, they eat something, and it's like tasty, but just not the same. So. I think it might be because they might not go into as in-depth looking at culture of the country that they're eating in or behind the food can yeah. actually affect always eat the store it's it's like a a good example is i have so many of my friends with me in it, right? because i like having them around i like showing them around and i had once like 11 people came at the same time we had a really nice vacation and i brought them to like one of my favorite places in Istanbul. like really good food the chefs are sent to the regional province and educated there. All the products come from one of the cities that's world culinary heritage. They got a huge menu, you know, everything is always perfect. The service is great. It's like one of this culinary stronghold of Turkey. And they go there and they like it so much, right? And then on the next day, I brought them to like my neighborhood kebab store in like a semi-ghetto district in a side street and like, you know, a dark street and like a small low-key place and flies are flying around but it's okay it's very cheap it was close to my place and i thought you know i just show them a little bit of the, the hidden Istanbul where no foreigners at all except like syrian refugees and they went there and all of them like the second restaurant mall now i would say you know food is always subjective but like objectively we could say a ferrari is better car than a fiat right and the first restaurant was in my opinion like really a lot better than the second one but none of them remembers the first restaurant all of them remember the second restaurant because there's a story you know packed into the, the experience you always eat the experience and you remember the experience and remembering food is actually the good food it's the food that you talk about you think about and you want to have again and the food that you forget is just you know, gone i think that's like seen in crazy rich asians where they eat in like the ha- the style the normal style what's it called was it in bugis junction yeah, is that yeah. What you're i when think they so because to- people think of asian food are like oh the best one is in restaurants but no the best ones are in the stalls i think uh more often than not i would say that best food is actually at home okay yeah but well, it is counting that <laughs> <laughs> Mom's best food <laughs> and grandma even better. But mom, I'm sorry. But <laughs> the food and styles I think are the very in this encounter. And it's it's actually also a story that I'm you know willing to, to tell over and over again because just if you go to Penan and I don't know about uh, you know the Jakarta in, in in Indonesia, but it's always almost always made from very old people who have a lot of scars on their hands and it's like the open heat and they're sweating on the 40 degrees of sun and that's just not a job that any rational person would do right you have the uh, option of being in an air-conditioned room and you know sitting in front of the desk and earning a good salary why 12 hours under the sunlight you know and burn yourself every single day it takes a irrational crazy person to sacrifice himself to a craft to just one single thing it's like i'm doing this this is my identity and i'm gonna do this in the best possible way every single time and these are the restaurants these are the stories they are the heroes for me you know? they are like michael jackson michael jordan in, in sports or music these are the chefs you know the, the people that don't have any names the old grumpy you know hawking uh, <laughs> Grandpa who just yeah. does the noodles. What do you, you want? Tell him it's good. He says, next person. These are the people that I love, you know. And every time I see them, you know, I'm like, I know that these guys won't be around for such a long time. They will. They will not be a next generation of people who will who will replace them. So I think it's important to tell the story. So hopefully, we can have more crazy people who take up the irrational decision of becoming a chef because that's also one of the things that Anthony Bourdain he recommends everybody to think twice about becoming a chef because they're not paid well they're gonna 
most likely end up in all the very difficult circumstances. People will treat you badly. People will not understand what you're doing, etc., etc. So there's so many obstacles to, to do such a decision, where it's much easier to just have a bad restaurant and scam Westerners with a quinoa salad <laughs> and over overprice them, which is basically every Thanks single tea. new place that opens in Vienna. So I'm sorry for the rent. That's uh, Oh, no, yeah. Close to my heart. Well, I guess to finish this up, which kind of cuisine would you like to, the dream cuisine that you would like to target now? So I went to Japan when I was in Taipei, and uh, it's also like a micro cosm, you know, in one street, like the representation of, of, of Japan, not really. Of Japan, that's one of the things that I discovered. When I went to Okinawa, for example, which is very close to Taipei, we had a very interesting, I had a very interesting experience because the food is completely different from other parts of Japan. I would say it's maybe closer to the southern Chinese food, food from Taipei, there are similarities, there's peanut tofu, they eat bitter melon, a lot of seafood oriented, like completely different, right? And you go to Osaka and Osaka culture-wise is also very different than from the Haiso food in, in Tokyo where I burned through my wallet for just eating and then your, your money just keeps disappearing. You're eating all this kind of stuff and it's very expensive. And then you go to Osaka where food is actually more affordable and more outside and more fried stuff and more things that go along with beer. So I think, you know, I, I don't think I will have that opportunity. But if there was a chance of me, you know, living one year in Tokyo or some other big city in Japan where I could just, you know, do the same MO, modus operandi I did in, in, in Taipei to just go to a different place every single day. I mean, if I had, if society had no expectations for me, if I had indefinite amount of money, I, that's what I would do if that's yeah, uh, a better answer. Yeah, because personally, I think the one area I'm curious about are the Polynesian islands, because we live, we really not, we live close but very far from them as well. But it is an area that I'm curious to taste their food because they definitely are underrepresented, right? Outside of, I think we've maybe there's some influences of Hawaiian food in America, and then that's about it. But like true Polynesian food, I think would be my interesting, like go-to target food. I just want to eat Indonesian food, honestly. <laughs> <laughs> Thank you, Tuna, for popping by. We're yeah. busy. Thank you. Thank you so much. I hope you have fun hearing this and tune in next week for another conversation. Bye. Hello. Hi. Thank you for listening to the Peak Boredom Podcast. This is Mars and Inga signing off. And don't forget to tune in next week. Please. Bye.